everyone. Yes, welcome everyone. Um, uh, my name is Clarence White. I am the Associate Director at the ESOC Freedom Library. Uh, we are so grateful for everyone's uh, attendance this evening. Um, uh, I'm especially grateful because uh, uh, Jake Jers has been a good friend of the library for a long time. We definitely appreciate his presence, his work, his partnership, uh, but also his scholarship. Uh, which he is willing to integrate into some everyday important conversations. Uh, as I like to say, one of the functions of the Eastside Freedom Library is to take knowledge and help integrate it into conversations that create a more true narrative about this place we live in. And we definitely appreciate Jake's part in, in, in creating that for us. Um, so, uh, from the Eastside Freedom Library, welcome. We are thrilled uh, that everyone is here tonight and also to be in partnership with the Ramsey County Historical Society and the Roseville Library. Uh, it is an ongoing fruitful partnership that um, we're glad you're all joining us for. Um, uh, I also want to say, and I think Robin will reiterate, reiterate this. We have many more events in this series. We also have many more events that we do throughout the throughout the week, throughout the month, and throughout the year. Um, you can go to our websites and see all of the events that, that we have uh, on an ongoing basis, and we invite you to join those conversations as well. Um, with that, I'm going to pass it off to Robin um, and uh, she will be introducing a few of the logistics and uh, our presenter for the evening. Robin? Thank you, Clarence. I'm Robin Priestley with the Ramsey County Historical Society. And to re reiterate Clarence's comments, I want to thank the Eastside Freedom Library and the Roseville Library for their support and partnership for the series of History Revealed programs we've been doing for years now. Um, it's always, uh, we're always very grateful for um, their support, partnership, and being able to bring programs to you like tonight's program. Um, if you're not a member of the Ramsey County Historical Society or the Eastside Freedom Library, please consider joining. We rely on the support of members and friends like you to continue to present these programs and all of our efforts. And there are some great benefits to joining the Ramsey County Historical Society, including our quarterly magazine, Ramsey County History, which is an award-winning publication, and free admission to Gibbs Farm, our historic site up on Larpenter in Cleveland. You can find out more about our CHS on our website, including upcoming programs, as Clarence mentioned, how to join, membership benefits, and more. And the address is www.rchs.com, which is up on the screen. So again, please check out our websites. Um, next week on Thursday night, we have another History Revealed with Dr. Jimmy Patino on Black, Brown, and Red Power in the Twin Cities parallels, intersections, and self-determination in a liberal haven. This will be a very special program. It's going to be online again, like tonight. So please see our websites for details and Zoom registrations. Um, as a reminder, um, we're keeping cameras and microphones turned off for now because of the large group. We will turn chat on um, after Dr. Yours' presentation so that you can put your questions and comments in the chat. And um, it will be recorded and will be up on our YouTube channels. So we would like to acknowledge this sacred Dakota land. Minnesota Mekoche, the land where the waters are so clear they reflect the clouds, is the ancestral and contemporary homeland of the Dakota people. It is also home to the Anishinaabe and other indigenous peoples. The Ramsey County Historical Society acknowledges that its sites are located on and benefit from these sacred Dakota lands. Ramsey County Historical Society is committed to preserving our past, 
informing our present and inspiring our future. Part of doing so is acknowledging the painful history and current challenges facing the Dakota people, just as we celebrate the contributions of Dakota and other Indigenous peoples. You can find our full land acknowledgement statement on our website. Again, it's www.rchs.com, which includes actionable ways in which Ramsey County Historical Society pledges to honor the Dakota and other Indigenous peoples of Minnesota Makoche. So RCHS and the Eastside Freedom Library is committed to presenting the stories and histories of all in our community. And we are so pleased to bring you tonight's program, which is part of our 2022 series, Making Minnesota, which exploring the often untold stories, the histories and experiences, some of the worldwide immigrant, African American and indigenous communities that make up this, our most diverse county. So I want to thank Dr. Jacob Jers tonight. Uh, Dr. Jers is an, is, is an adjunct professor of United States and Indigenous History at the University of St. Thomas and at Metro State University, and was a member of the St. Thomas Land Acknowledgement Committee. His recently published article in the American Indian Quarterly, Relations Across the Land, Ojibwe and Dakota interactions in the indigenous borderlands of the Western Great Lakes explores the history of intertribal diplomacy and his current book project is Bountiful Boundaries, Western Great Lakes, Indigenous Borderlands and American Statecraft. I also wanna thank Subtext Books for their partnership. So please check them out for Dr. Jer's book and all of our other history revealed titles. So again, thank you for being here tonight. Greetings all, let me share this screen and we'll get started. Hao, Jacob Jers, Imakia, Pia, Buju, Jacob Jers, Indigenous Cause, and hello and greetings. My name is Dr. Jacob Jers. I am an East Side St. Paul resident and an incoming uh, visiting assistant professor of indigenous history at McAllister College. I thank you all for making the time this evening to participate in this lecture series put on the Ramsey County Historical Society, the Roseville Library, and the East Side Freedom Library. While we're meeting virtually tonight, I'm coming to you from Dakota lands in a state carved out of the homelands of the Dakota and Ojibwe people and in a country built through genocide. I'm excited to see so much interest in tonight's subject. And I wanna be clear right up front that I am not indigenous. I do not speak on the behalf of any tribe nor can any one person speak for the entirety of the population. I approach this question as a historian and I believe to fully engage with the subject, we need many different kinds of teachers coming from many different perspectives and offering just their piece of this mosaic of the historical past. So at the end of this presentation, I've included a few additional materials, primarily indigenous led organizations and scholars with uh, roots in the Twin Cities. Um, with the hope that this presentation is only the first step through a doorway for some, and maybe that initial inclining diving into more of this history for others. My own presentation tonight is largely derived from my recent article in the American Indian Quarterly and my current book project on 18th and 19th century Ojibwe relations with the Dakota and Americans. And while my scholarship focuses mainly on this early modern era, it has everything to do with our contemporary debates and issues surrounding land acknowledgements and the land back movement. From what I can see, we've got a, a fairly diverse audience tonight um, coming to this topic with a variety of lived experiences and knowledge. Tonight's topic is, is fairly broad. My presentation will offer an introduction to some of these themes with an in-depth case study focusing on one particular treaty. I look forward to delving more deeply into this subject during our discussion portion of the evening. And I'm thinking that perhaps some of you already have some questions, like how does this history connect to me? Maybe your ancestors came here as refugees themselves, escaping persecution. Maybe you're a recent immigrant, or perhaps your ancestors were enslaved and forced to this land. 
Perhaps they were even victims of violence during the Dakota War of 1862. Maybe you recently learned that they were the enslavers or they took an active role in the colonization of this land. How does this family history actually tie to land acknowledgements that we hear? And what can a land acknowledgement even do or even an apology do about this past? How do you begin to address genocide? Would it be better to move on, brush it under the rug? Or perhaps you're deeply angered by this. Perhaps you know this history and you've already lived through this history. So what are we to do? You've heard land acknowledgements before, including this evening. We had one at the top of our presentation. And they can range from a single sentence noting someone's ancestral lands to a multi-paragraph statement that outlines a new direction. But what is being acknowledged when we acknowledge the land? I've got mixed emotions myself uh, about these statements. And increasingly, I find myself moving towards, towards a focus on the relationship that our organizations and individuals have between each other, indigenous lands and indigenous nations themselves. So tonight we're gonna to narrow in on just one such relationship because when we use a land acknowledgement, we're acknowledging something messy. It's a complexity of relationships. And it's something that no single statement can fully encompass, but we can at least present this door for us to walk through in order to have and foster new conversations. For myself, studying this subject for the last decade, I've really ranged through a host of emotions. These emotions can often drive action, they certainly can, but sometimes it feels like action that is directionless, that perhaps this action is hotly generated, but it's without any type of sustainable movement. Inequity and historical justices are really quite difficult to root out. It's because they're often difficult to see within the entirety of a structure. Scholars increasingly are paying attention to these structures and they're trying to model how institutional racism has been baked into our society. Now, depending on who you are, these structures may be completely clear to you and you feel them on a daily basis or you may not recognize them as barriers to yourself, yet despite that, they remain so all the same. Consider a building. This is a metaphor I like to use with my students in the classroom. And we talk about this building has walls, it has floors, it has lightings, it has all these visible aspects of a structure, and we don't necessarily think about why those walls are in the location they are, and these walls, they gently direct us. You go down a hallway, you go through doorways, uh, you flick on a light, a light switch, is thrown and you have light. And we often don't think about it until something goes wrong. The light burns out or unlike every single renovation show that you've ever watched in your entire life, someone wants to remove a load bearing wall and then there's problems that ensue. It's not until we begin to peer back these layers to see what's not always immediately apparent but influencing all the same. That's the structures that I'm talking about. And in a similar manner, our history is shaping our present. And it's a shape that can mold how other people see us and interact with us, but also how we see ourselves. These are structural inequalities and institutional racism. They are insidious because like a new homeowner who moves into this new house, people with the best intentions may wish to change a system, but they fail time and time again because of an underestimation of how rooted such structures are, a lack of funding, or the realization that perhaps an entire structure is so rotten that it has to be pulled down and rebuilt if the desired effects are to be achieved. We live in systems. And while we may want to change, without this historical understanding, we don't even have the blueprints for systemic change. Without peeling back these layers, we risk putting on new paint on a deteriorating building. And a land acknowledgement, without understanding this history on a deeper level, of that land itself is simply a new coat of paint. We need to renovate. We need new relationships. So tonight, we're all coming together at different points, different experiences, different points on this journey. And I wanna prime this discussion that we'll have at the end of this presentation with an examination of this 18th century relationship centered on the Ojibwe and Dakota that influences a 19th century treaty 
that impacts us today in the 21st. I'd like us to consider how better understanding these tiny moments, these case studies, they begin filling in our blueprints of the present. And so with that at the top of my own mind, I want to remember that we are the relationships we choose to form. Indigenous history is United States history, and for our purposes, Minnesota history particularly, they can't be separated. And knowing only one without the other leaves gaps in our world model. Land acknowledgements without actions are dead words. And such words have been spoken to indigenous peoples and broken before time and time again. However, such statements are not without their value. And they can prove to be these jumping off points for a series of more in-depth conversations where perhaps no mention of this existed before. And I think that real change, if we are really seeking it, only comes from authentic and reciprocal relationships. My historical argument, my academic scholarly argument is that these relationships are rooted in the land. And prior to the American arrival, Dakota and Ojibwe people populated an indigenous borderland that existed through interpersonal relations between people and the gifts of this natural world. The treaty era with the United States shifted that relationship. And that was a shift that was ahead of genocidal policies later that attempted to eradicate these relationships that the people had completely. So hearkening back, at the beginning of this talk, I used three languages. Not necessarily well, still a learner, but I used three. First was Dakota, and that's the language spoken by the indigenous people who are ethnically cleansed from the state of Minnesota. Now, despite this history, Dakota communities continue to persist in Minnesota, most visibly in the form of the four recon federally recognized Dakota communities, including Prairie Island, the Shakopee Matawakaton, the Lower Sioux, and Upper Sioux communities, but also in the unrecognized Mendota, Dakota, and hundreds of other Dakota individuals living throughout the Twin Cities and further out state. The second language that I agree to Jin is Anishinaabeland. It's a language of the Anishinaabe, a group of peoples made up of the Three Fires Confederacy, the Potawatomi, the Odawa, and Ojibwe. Now within our state of Minnesota, there are seven federally recognized Ojibwe bands, including Red Lake, Mille Lacs, Boise Fort, Leech Lake, Fond du Lac, Grand Portage, and the White Earth Ojibwe Nation. And the White Earth Ojibwe Nation is what my wife and my sons are descended from. This is a, a little picture uh, of, of my boy, uh, Theo, chilling in his cradle board um, that I, I was able to help carve with, with my extended family here. The third language was English. And I think it's important for scholars to situate themselves in their background in relation to their research. So as I said, my, my wife and my children are White Earth Ojibwe descendants. I myself am white. My ancestry is a little bit different. It stretches to Germany, the Netherlands, Bohemia, various Central and Eastern European nations, probably not dissimilar to many of you. Five generations ago, they arrived in Milwaukee in the north woods of Wisconsin. They came as loggers, as blacksmiths, liquor dealers, before I came along and attended the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and then later on Michigan State for my PhD, now in my recent current position at McAllister. So we have these three languages and they're overlapping and they have overlapping ties to this land. It's certainly not the only languages and traditions that are essential to understanding Minnesota, but it's a start and they are essential for tonight's story. So my current research is, is woven into a greater tapestry. It's a greater tapestry of work done by native and non-native scholars who seek to better understand these relations between the United States federal government and indigenous nations. Tonight, I'm presenting a detailed case study of Ojibwe relations with the Dakota and the Americans at the pivotal 1825 Prairie du Chien Treaty Council. As an example that demonstrating land acknowledgement is far from a simple statement, but refers to this host of relationships. While 100% true a land acknowledgement like this is Dakota land contains it in, in it multitudes that are far more complex than those words might generally call to mind. These multitudes of complexities demand far more action on us than these words can simply provide. So let's begin filling in our historical blueprint and our drawing from this moment in time. 
A key interface point lies with this 1825 Prairie du Chien Treaty Council. And this is an image on your screen right now. It was done by J.O. Lewis, and its influence inspired my own research for several years. You'll see in the center of it, there's a large American flag. It's, it's billowing in an unseen breeze. And if you allow your eye to be drawn down that flagpole, you'll see a podium. And there's this bower of trees, and there are these two white men who are standing up, and presumably they are Lewis Cass, who is the territorial governor of Michigan Territory from 1813 to 1831. Now, alongside him is William Clark, famously of the Lewis and Clark expedition. By 1825, Clark's career has continued, and he has become the governor of the Missouri Territory. These men are standing up, and they're addressing an assembly of Western Great Lakes Native American peoples. And they're sitting all circled around them. Directly to the right, you can see five neat rows of American soldiers, and they're sitting upright, rigidly at attention. Well, there are four others that are standing guard and threat in front of three white tents. In the foreground, what we see in this image are daily lives, daily tasks, the images of mothers tendering children. Now, most of the indigenous peoples depicted in this image are nearly naked as opposed to the Americans who are fully clothed in their blue uniforms, sitting at attention or, or standing with their long bayonet knived equipped guns. We see three more American flags in this image and it's further clarifying, I think the artist's intention to, de to remove any doubt of who has jurisdiction, who has authority in this region, that the Americans believe themselves central in the struggle for power in the Great Lakes. They also wanted to be seen as peacemakers. My argument has been that this image is sanitized. It's neat, it's organized, it's cleansed of the messiness of this region and the complexity that made up intertribal diplomacy. In other words, it's not a true representation of the events portrayed. There were nine different tribes at this treaty council, yet I struggle anyway to determine any tribal distinctions between the individuals in this image. Even that idea of tribal identity simplifies the complexity of the late 18th and early 19th century, where these ideas of the individual, families, villages, bands, they were often more meaningful concepts than a tribal identity. Simply, this picture distorts how power and authority operated within the Great Lakes and within tribal villages themselves. What the Americans saw in this region was a map and it was empty of organized space. It was void of borders. It lacked property lines that were easy to commodify and turn into a governable and profitable homestead. But with seemingly complex and convoluted relations somehow present. Following the War of 1812, the growing American Republic believed that the Western Great Lakes were rightfully theirs. They had fought a war for it once again. During that war, many of the Western Great Lakes villages, including several Dakota and Ojibwe villages, sided with the British against the Americans. And then following that war all the way through the 1840s, American officials were continuously worried and concerned over these relations between the British and Native American tribes. It prompted American tribes for more negotiations and treaties with tribes in this region. Many of the Americans sought not just to use the resources, but then to commodify this land. It really was a breakdown of the relationship into something new, private property. From that private property, generate profit. The efforts were largely led by Michigan Territorial Governor Lewis Cass, who used these treaty councils with tribes to attempt to force tribal leaders to recognize American sovereignty in the region. These treaties were part of a larger strategy by the Americans to assert their paper authority to power on the ground. The Americans ran into several different issues, though, dealing with tribes like the Ojibwe and Dakota. While you had this loose confederation of villages and bands, um, it limited the ability of Native American leaders to present a unified military opposition to European American threats. Their decentralized nation, nature of these tribal governance also frustrated American attempts to quickly assert the authority over the region. Americans were encountering a borderland region between themselves and what they perceived as Western tribes, but they were also trying to assert their own power over what I'm terming an indigenous borderland. And this was made up of living relational networks between the individual, the land, 
the spiritual and natural worlds. These overlapping connections ensured access to life-sustaining gifts of the world that were sometimes shared through overlapping spaces of utilization between peoples. While the Western Great Lakes were Dakota homelands, Ojibwe oral tradition maintains a multi-generation migration narrative that also helps explain how they came to these lands at the edge of the Western Great Lakes. And it's something else to keep in mind in these land acknowledgements. Because present and entangled in these rich narratives is a 350 year history of European colonial, like, colonialism instead of the colonialism. We have the fur trade, we have indigenous oral traditions, all of this further complexing and interconnected understanding for why and how the Ojibwe moved into Dakota territory and the upper Great Lakes. These Ojibwe movements from the East Coast to the Great Lakes began prior to sustained contact with the Europeans. And it was after the discovery of the Europeans by the Ojibwe, after discovering them to attempt to create settlements on the Eastern shores of the continent by native nations. This created additional ripples and movements throughout North America. During the 17th century, the Anishinaabe had endured a series of wars with the Haudenosaunee as well. And during the next century, the Anishinaabe expanded their villages, increased both their trading power and their influence throughout these Great Lakes. They did so by extending their kinship ties with other families, with other bands, and with other tribes. They cemented their connections to villages along the shores of Lake Michigan and moved westward along Lake Superior. And these villages located along the western shores of Lake Michigan pulled indigenous communities into the Great Lakes region. And it created these mixed communities at places like Milwaukee and Green Bay. You had mixed trading communities and many different nations. Around 1650, coming closer to our story here in, in Minnesota, you have an Ojibwe community that's established at what becomes one of the largest village sites on the shores of Lake Superior called La Pointe. Now, there's no single capital of the Anishinaabe. You can't think of the nation in this way, but there are important village sites where communities often gathered in large groups. And the point is one of these sites. It becomes the largest Anishinaabe village on the western edge of Lake Superior. Of mixed uh, Ojibwe and, and European heritage is, is one 19th century historian, William Warren. And he provides a, a lot of the insight that we have of this moment. And he talks about that at La Pointe, the Ojibwe elders he interviewed for his history of the Ojibwe people explained that, quote, for a number of years, the Ojibwe continued to consider the bays of Schwamakong as their common home, and their hunting parties returned there at different seasons of the year, unquote. Warren's note is just a small slice of Ojibwe life in the lead up to this peace accords that are going to come between the Eastern Dakota communities and these westward located Ojibwe. As Ojibwe hunters were based at this Western edge of Lake Superior, they continued to travel into points further west and south. And they were hunting. They were increasingly coming into conflict though with Dakota peoples. To resolve these conflicts, a series of talks were held between 1678 and 79 during the winter and it's these diplomatic talks between the Ojibwe and Dakota that are of interest to us. From the French, uh, fur trader, Grayson Duluth, from whom Duluth uh, takes its name, he was present at some of these conversations. And based on his writings of the events, historians have likely overstated the effectiveness of his presence in these negotiations. He often inflates his role as this peace bringer between the Dakota and the Ojibwe. Of course, indigenous historians have pushed back on this, including uh, Michael Wicken, who argues instead we should be viewing these two indigenous nations as negotiating only for their own reasons, regardless of what the French were trying to do. They were using the presence of the French of Duluth when it suited their purposes. Duluth's writings of the event conveniently place him as a central figure in the peacemaking progress, but Wiccan doesn't buy this. He doesn't fully accept this narrative and there's strong evidence to refute what Duluth is saying here. Instead, Wiccan points out that Ojibwe and Dakota had been working towards this peace and meeting outside of the more ceremonial talks that Duluth had been allowed to attend. Wiccan's research itself points to an indigenous specific reasons for why the Ojibwe and Dakota might want peace within, with each other. Geopolitically at this time, Meskwaki Sauk tribes living further south, uh, right about Wisconsin area, and were a growing concern for both the Ojibwe and Dakota. 
but by ailing their communities together, they could safely turn their focus towards the Meswaki and Sauk. This is exactly what happened after these peace accords in 1678 to 79. In the peace that resulted from these accords, it held for about 50 years until the end of something called the Fox Wars, till about 1733. So what flourishes in these intervening years, these 50 years, are this indigenous borderland between these communities, between these two tribes. And what you see is instead of warfare, is increasingly peaceful intertribal relations, even intermarriage between these groups. The Ojibwe established communities closer to the Eastern Dakota, the frequency they encountered Dakota communities increased. And while violence is a part of it, I, I don't want to romanticize this portion of, of, of the past, certainly shared access to shared resources are also a part of it. What we see is a mutual beneficial relationship and it included instances of marriage and likely cross-cultural sharing. What likely existed in many parts of what we called Minnesota was some amount of alliance and some shared access to resources needed by both native communities. Now, expanding their access to hunting and trapping territory certainly pro was propelling Ojibwe communities further west. They were um, addressing the pull of an increasing large global market for beaver furs, but at a more micro level, there were other forces at work. And a key concern uh, for these communities of the greatest import was that of wild rice and maple sugar. So I, I don't need to tell many of you that winter's a harsh season. And of course, we have winter around the corner. I hate to break it to you. Writing in 1840, there's an American agent named C.C. Trollbridge. He's writing to, to Lewis Cass on the regional conditions. And he states during winter that some Ojibwe are living on quote, small acorns or beech nuts to make it through this winter, unquote. The report went further on to state that the extreme winter weather could cause starvation to affect quote, whole lodges, say 30 or 40 at a time, as has actually taken place at the Fond du Lac country of Lake Superior with a few years past, unquote. To combat the specter of winter, communities needed to work earlier in the season to ensure that enough food was available. Now stored properly, wild rice and maple sugar could last for months while providing essential calories and nutrients. Wild rice beds and maple sugar groves are an important location to consider the power dynamics within an Ojibwe community. So focusing in, men are often seen, not always, but often seen as hunters and trappers. Whereas women are controlling and directing wild rice and maple sugar harvests of at least the 18th century. Part of women's role was to maintain this proper relationship, this relationship between community members, and most importantly, between the community itself and the gifts of the manado, which include wild rice and maple sugar. In the instances of sugar bush locations, women themselves maintained individual usage plots. Each person had their area where their family could harvest from. These sugar plots were actually passed down from one mother to a daughter, along with all the tools and materials that you needed to harvest the sap. If a family didn't have any, they could come to the community council, petition the community for access, but you needed to have permission. Permission is important. You can't just take from the harvest. Women also controlled who had access to wild rice locations, and they even would mark sections by tying colorful cloth to individual stalks. Now, while hunting provided some meat for the community and the resulting furs certainly could be traded for goods, it's these gathered resources, this wild rice, this maple sugar, berries, along with fishing, that really are helping ensure survival for the communities, whether or not the hunting is successful. So I'm going to pause right here because I'm talking a great deal about these gathered resources. When I say my wife and I were discussing the, this conversation, what I was going to say tonight, and, and, and she remarked to me, you're talking about land acknowledgement. How do you possibly write a land acknowledgement without acknowledging the actual land, the land that grows this wild rice, the land that grows the trees that make the maple sugar and maple syrup that brings sweetness to our lives? She was reminding me about the importance of not the, only the people and the relationship people have, but going beyond resources and thinking of gifts, 
and how that reciprocal relationship is something that we should be calling to mind in our own acknowledgments. If we are writing an authentic acknowledgement, these are gifts for us, she was saying, as they were for the ancestors, and they are a reminder of the limitation of many acknowledgments that we see in our current day. Following the breakdown of relations between the Ojibwe and Dakota after the Fox Wars of the 1730s, there's evidence that Ojibwe families continued to move steadily south and west. By 1768, historian Helen Tanner's research suggests that Dakota villages at Malox and Sandy Lake now consisted mainly of Ojibwe families. By this point in time, these sites represented the southern west most, uh, the southwestern most villages of the Ojibwe. They had extended their hunting range, and that contributed a little bit to this movement, but likely were these gathered resources, these gathered gifts because surrounding these village sites are bountiful amounts of wild rice and sugar stands. Hunters and animals that they sought, they're mobile. Hunters could and did travel long distances to hunt for these animals, but maple sugar, wild rice beds, they're not so mobile. Trees are rooted in the ground. Wild rice, it's in certain lakes and you need precise conditions to those lakes, which is sidetrack why climate change is so concerning. To ensure enough storable food for the long winter in the larger community, these village sites needed to be near these gathered resources. So the Ojibwe who are first moving into their homes in the Sandy Lake region, they're coming from these villages located on the shores of Lake Superior. They didn't end up at Sandy Lake by any mere chance. In addition to the rich gifts of wild rice in the region, it's the waters surrounding Sandy Lake that form this important liquid borderland. This liquid borderland links the waters of Lake Superior to those that flow to the Mississippi River. If you're a paddler at Lake Superior, you could actually follow a western direction of the St. Louis River to East Savannah River. There, there's a, a vital portage, and it's a long portage, but it's a vital portage that you can walk to the West Savannah River, and that flows into Sandy Lake. And from those waters of Sandy Lake, you could, on a canoe, continue to the Mississippi River and its hundreds of tributaries. You can see the continent. The importance of Sandy Lake is that it links these waterways of Lake Superior to the Mississippi River. And that's further reflected by the mere fact of where fur trading posts were located, including one being established there in 1794 that was occupied throughout the early 1800s. The Sandy Lake region is, linked, is linking these two key waterways of the Great Lakes and Mississippi River. It's this geographical meeting zone of water and the Dakota and Ojibwe peoples. And while the Sandy Lake Portage and Greater Region become an Ojibwe Dakota borderland, the region still and remains to this day part of the Dakota homelands. So it's among these roots and among these indigenous conflicts, these diplomatic actions, these histories of families joining and separating, reforming, that we have the Americans entering into this story. So let's pull them in quickly. They're doing so not in the way that the French fur traders were. French fur traders often sought family relations to secure their access to the fur trade. And the British, they weren't really like the British either. The British were setting up uh, trading forts. They had nominal diplomatic ties. But the Americans are seeking to do something different. They're seeking a new form of relationship, a reformation of these indigenous borderlands that I was describing briefly. They want a harder border between the Americans and tribal nations. The Americans were a new nation in this kaleidoscope of peoples. We often teach that new people on this eastern edge banded together, and they were creating a new system to throw off the undemocratic taxation without colonial consent. Yet, let's add to that theme a little bit more, because as we know, the past is always more complex. And one of the still unrecognized causes of the American Revolution Underrecognizes, I, I won't say unrecognized, but underrecognized causes of the American Revolution was the American colonists' desire to expand into the Ohio River Valley and the poor relations that followed with indigenous tribes. So, what I have here is the proclamation line of 1763. The British King George had banned American colonists from creating homelands west of the Appalachian Mountains. This is in part done to maintain, um, to reduce the cost of maintaining a standing army along the edges of the colonies to limit problems caused by the colonists themselves from running afoul of the region's tribes. 
But many of the American colonists didn't see it this way. Instead of what they saw this proclamation to be was an infringement of their rights. Even embedded into the Declaration of Independence, we see this rearing up once again. You see, in, in, in the Declaration of Independence, there is a call for the justification for this revolution that the Americans are entering into. And they issue 27 grievances against the king. In the final grievance, the 27th grievance, they state that the king has excited domestic insurrections among us and endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. Now, domestic insurrections that they are referring to here are revolts of liberation by enslaved Africans. The second part of this 27th grievance relates to the increased resistance that tribes were putting up in the Ohio River Valley and Southern Appalachia. They were at times fighting against the American colonists who were illegally invading into their lands. In the aftermath of the War for American Independence, these lands of the Ohio River Valley were immediately targeted for annexation into the New Republic. And many of the native lands were taken through force or through treaty. In many areas of the country, this wealth was then extracted from these lands through the enslavement of Black people working on these indigenous lands. In its infancy itself, the United States government confronted this question of how it would engage with tribes. So there are some like Thomas Jefferson who thought that once tribal members became farmers, they would freely trade with the United States for all their farming implements. And in Jefferson's idealized trade, you see these more insidious goals. He believed that Native Americans would, quote, be willing to par off lands from time to time in exchange for necessities for their farms and families. The strategy is, is going to be enhanced by the tactic of driving influential individuals into debt and then forcing the sale of land at treaties to pay down those inflated debts held by the traders, who themselves were often present at these councils. During the Jefferson administration, when we were talking about Lewis and Clark, right, they're dispatched on their journey west, Jefferson sends another less well-known expedition, Lieutenant Zebion Pike's exploration of the upper Mississippi. Pike himself ends up signing the first treaty between two Dakota men in the United States and what becomes Minnesota near Bedote, at the confluence of the Mississippi and Minnesota rivers where Fort, Occupy, Occupy, Fort Snelling occupies Dakota land. And this is signed on September 23rd, 1805. While additional Dakota leaders were present, it's unclear if they accepted this treaty or if they even refused to just acknowledge it. What the treaty did is it called for an establishment of a military post, and that is the future uh, Fort Snelling. Though Pike left blank how much the United States would pay. Once it's sent back to the Senate, a payment of $2,000 or one cent and 28 mils an acre was added and sent to President Jefferson's desk. But he never proclaims the treaty. And thus, it remains questionable if the treaty is actually ever enforced. And later, you have several attempts to try to clarify this fort status, if this land was actually legally bought or sold. Despite American designs of the region, the Great Lakes were slow to embrace American political organization or recognize American authority. While American Indian tribes had their own reasons for fighting or not during the War of 1812, the Americans were concerned at how quickly the British reestablished themselves throughout the Great Lakes during the war. In the immediate aftermath of the war, American agents, including the newly appointed governor of Michigan Territory, Lewis Class, Cass, embarked on a journey throughout the western stretches of the territory, signing treaties with tribes and promising peace, but demanding recognition of American authority. On the ground, this recognition had largely mixed results, and rather the indigenous borderland continued to guide indigenous relationships. So we're coming back to 1825. And in 1825, we find Governor Cass sitting in Detroit, and he is brooding over what he sees as this problem at the western reaches of Michigan Territory, along the upper Mississippi River. The Chippewa and Dakota hunting pardon parties have started fighting once again. They are routinely intercepting each other, and it's often leading to violent skirmishes. Indian agents in this region are sending frantic letters back to Detroit to keeping Cass updated on these events, and they seem to be growing increasingly more frequently uh, throughout 1824. The Americans thought 
that they knew generally where the Ojibwe established their villages and likewise where the Dakota typically had their villages. And it appeared, at least to Cass, that these hunting boundaries were permeable. And Cass believed that this lack of firm boundaries is really the root cause between this conflict. So Cass might have ignored this if the fighting had remained small skirmishes. But American traders and settlers were increasingly caught between this crossfire, including an American fur trader named Finley, who was apparently killed by a group of Ojibwe men, and they refused to be brought to trial. The killing is probably less concerning to Cass. It is the refusal of American authority to try these men that really concerns him. News reports of the Dakota and Ojibwe fighting in the East further dampened American settlers' enthusiasm to establish homesteads in the region. And this dampened enthusiasm for the territory that Cass governed was detrimental to him personally, professionally, and financially. Cass was also concerned with this borderless region because of the close ties to British Canada that were made present after the War of 1812. So the British were renewing their connections to these tribes in the Great Lakes, and each trading season they ignored American sovereignty in the region. And Cass, as this self-styled expert on American Indian affairs, he believed that he could form a treaty, an expedition, that would necessarily secure peace in the western outreaches of Michigan territory, what we now call Minnesota. So the governor petitions the federal government to join with Indian agent uh, Lawrence Talaferro and St. Louis Superintendent of Indian Affairs in the West, William Clark. And they plan to hold this treaty council at Prairie du Chien in the late summer of 1825 to map out these boundaries between the tribes in Western Michigan territory and force these tribes to acknowledge the Americans' authority. Somewhat unique for this time period is that 1825 is not a treaty of secession. There are not any lands that are purchased or taken by the United States but it affects all future treaty negotiations. Cass and Clark hated the ambiguity that they dealt with in treaty councils. Whose land was who, who needed to be present at discussions, where borders existed, where they didn't. They believed that these lack of clear lines in their minds, it was the reason why fighting. So they wanted to solidify those. There's also more insidious reasons later on that we'll see. And so we're back to this image of J.O. Lewis's 1825 Prudishin Treaty Council. And of course, nine other tribes, it's not just the Ojibwe and Dakota who are invited. They're two of the key tribes, but it's nine different tribes with almost a thousand people present for this council and all the activities. And so indigenous leaders took three broad strategies. The first would be represented by a leader like Black Hawk, who in seven years time is going to lead his own band across the Mississippi River in defiance of what he saw a league of illegal treaty negotiations. He's not recorded in the treaty minutes and he may have rejected completely the authority of the Americans by not attending or participating. The second strategy that's employed by this council is represented by the Iowa leader, White Cloud, who argued that his village did not and could not claim any lands in particular. But instead, the people went back and forth on their friends' lands because these spaces are held communally and they could not be repackaged and sold as this commodity that the Americans were seeking. Now, some leaders also took a third path and they saw some utility in claiming a particular parcel of land for their community, perhaps defended by the Americans later on. Ojibwe leader Hole in the Day is even recorded as saying that his band claimed their piece of land by conquest, a claim that the Americans immediately decided to recognize as justify. Now, these are shifting viewpoints in the indigenous community, and they are disrupting this bordered land. They're influencing how authority is used and wield and where power is located. And at the conclusion of the council, a treaty is going to be signed. Those native leaders that the Americans could convince to make their mark agreed to newly solidified boundaries to be surveyed at a later date. And that date came a decade later and buried in the National Archives is this journal from one of the survey party. And in it, they note how frustrated they are because these young Ojibwe men are following behind them and they're pulling up all their markers. Now, despite the actions of these young Ojibwe men pulling up these survey stakes, a series of treaties continue to follow. The Americans decide to charge ahead with treaties of secession based on the 1825 Treaty Prairie du Chien lines. But even as these native leaders are increasingly forced in difficult positions, 
They are continuing to protect their access to these gifts of the natural world. They are trying to defend this relationship that they have had for hundreds of years. And this is a key element in the exercise of their tribal society, sovereignty. So we're coming rapidly to the discussion portion of, of this, but before we do, I'd like one, one final sketch. Just bear with me, one final sketch from one of those subsequent treaties. And it offers this different way of moving through the world than the ones that the American officials were trying to force upon these nations. In 1837, we see Ojibwe Ogama flop now. He's present at 1825. And he's also present later on in 1837. And he is speaking his mind about the secession that's on the table. He is wary of the final language. And he argues that if the lands were his, he would demand an annuity that lasted, quote, as long as the ground lasted. You know that without the lands and the rivers and lakes, we could not live. We hunt and make sugar and dig fruits upon the former while we fish and obtain rice and drink from the latter. Flatmouth is arguing that it's in addition to the importance of fish, of rice that come from the waters, the waters themselves are the important element. The benefits that they derive from this natural world are described as resources, but they're more than that. And Flatmouth explains, my father, your children are willing to let you have their lands, but they wish to reserve the privilege of making sugar from the trees and getting their living from the lakes and rivers, as they have done here, there, for and of remaining in this country. It's hard to give up these lands. They will remain and cannot be destroyed, but you may cut down the trees and others will grow up. You know we cannot live deprived of our lakes and rivers. There is some game on the lands yet, and for that reason also we wish to remain upon them to get a living. Sometimes we scrape the tree and eat of the bark. The great spirit above made the earth and causes it to produce, which enables us to live. So this relationship, and it's a relationship he's describing. This relationship of Flatmouth is explaining is part of the life ways many Ojibwe leaders had in the 1837 council and that they were trying to protect. This is a relationship that's modeled by the Matado for the humans to live out. It's imperfect. And certainly there's conflict. It's, it's not conflict free. I don't want to romanticize this past, create some caricature of natural harmony that everyone was getting along but rather it is a, an attempt to better understand by reading these words, this holy human relationship that's tied to the land, but built on reciprocity with the greater world. So I'm taking on just this small case study in 1825 and expanding it out. I mean, we, we, what we really should have is this talk shouldn't end with me tonight. We should have an entire series of indigenous scholars, of elders and youth and we have, I mean, you, you can look uh, on the website at some of the YouTube videos, but I, I think we could expand our conversation and we could add to this historical blueprint that we're trying to create and we could highlight the walls that they want to tear down. The treaty era attempted to create this new relationship to land. And this is the first swipe of erasure that the Americans whose brush with the industrial revolution had already morphed many of their relationships. Turning back to tonight's theme, what do land acknowledgements do? They resist the constant amnesia that surrounds us. Land acknowledgements must recognize that spiraling out from this treaty area comes the attempted physical erasure of indigenous people through wars of ethnic cleansing and genocide, including the aftermath of the Dakota War of 1862. Land acknowledgements acknowledge the erasure of cultural thought through the force assimilation and abuse present in boarding schools. Land acknowledgements, they acknowledge the forced sterilizations, the banning of indigenous religious practices, the termination era, the relocation era, and so on and so on. Yet they acknowledge that indigenous communities continue to resist and persist in a world, which is why land acknowledgements must also state that not only are they on ancestral homelands, which is always inaccurate, leaving it at that, but that these ancestral homelands are also the current homelands of indigenous people. Indigenous people are still here. We are community members. I'm hoping you're here present tonight. My own family is an indication of the survivance of indigenous communities. So what do land acknowledgements reveal about the making of Minnesota? Generally, not much. They can't. 
Even the best land acknowledgements can't change this past. But what they do do well is honestly acknowledge the asymmetrical history of power and the benefits derived for non-native people from these pol policies of erasure. And one benefit of acknowledgement is that you refuse to accept this erasure. And as we increase the common knowledge, as we participate in conversations like this, as we read additional books of the very method of the various methods that societies move through the world, we generate potential new methods for our own time. But the words without action ring hollow. And the land back movement is seeking to physically restore these lands to their original guardians. And there are dozens of workable solutions for how this can be accomplished. So I'll end with this. Because of course, relationships are difficult. They're messy. We're going to make mistakes. History can provide us with a blueprint of how we arrived at this moment. But we can renovate with a new vision of the future. So I want to thank you all for your time. And I'm looking forward to this deeper discussion. What I've included in these last two slides are a small listing of a couple of other scholars who you should read beyond me. Um, and here are a couple organizations that are local in, in, in the Twin Cities. And I'm sure that we can find uh, more links to put this up on the website. But thanks all. Thank you, Jacob. This is an enlightening conversation. And I'd like to invite people to put um, short questions and comments in the chat. We've enabled that now. And um, Jacob should be able to answer those. If you're trying to type and it's not working, please uh, try to let me know. So there was a question. Um, can you talk about the term of stolen land? In terms of why why is it stolen if, if there are treaties? Um, why why the term generally? I'll I'll, I'll speak generally. Um, treaties were were often mistranslated implemented under duress uh, through the use of, of alcohol at times, um, often asymmetrically written and entered into. And so they largely don't hold up. And so taking something that was not yours, um, often by force, relates back to, to stealing that, that portion of, uh, of the land. And so that's a easier way to frame um, the history of this land in two words, rather than going through treaty by treaty, the mistranslations, um, the purposefully done mis mistranslations oftentimes, uh, the duress put under um, the uh, illegal warfare that was entered into, uh, the wars of, of aggression, the genocidal actions, and then the uh, taking uh, of that land. And so that's why stoling is often a very accurate term um, for, for this land. So I think um, the questioner clarified the question about, um, is the term stolen land in an acknowledgement a good or a bad idea? Good or a bad idea? I would, so re referring back to acknowledgements th themselves, uh, and, and this this might be a, a more broad 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 answer. I am I, I waver back and forth on the benefit of land acknowledgments generally anymore. In the beginning, land acknowledgments I, I, I thought were doing a good thing. They were bringing attention um, to this stolen land and, and this history from organizations that that happened. And in recent years, they've become a little bit boilerplate. And so when, when you're saying, is the term stolen land good to put in there or not? My question is, why are you writing a land acknowledgement? What's your organization or your individual reasoning for writing that? And that might guide whether or not you're going to put a term like stolen land in. Generally, I'd say, yeah, it, it would be a very appropriate statement to put into a land acknowledgement. 
but why are you writing a land acknowledgement in the first place? Have you done self-reflection of your organization or of yourself as an individual? What's the reasoning for crafting this statement? Do you have relations with contemporary indigenous peoples? Do you have relations with contemporary indigenous communities? Um, what is that relationship? Has your organization benefited from land that whatever organization it is, it is, is put upon? Do you know whose lands your organization is on? Do you know how that land came to be? Did you do a little bit of research of which treaty it was? And if you do that, you, you might begin to see, well, stolen land is, is a great term, or perhaps we need to expand even beyond that and provide additional details. So the short answer, yes, completely appropriate. Longer answer, have you thought deeply about why you're bothering to write a land acknowledgement? Thank you. Um, let's see. The next question is, is the presence of settlers in the late 17th century ever seen as instigating conflict between the Dakota and Chippewa peoples? Short answer, yes. The longer answer is that non-Native people were often seen as, as tools as well as Indigenous peoples. That if you could have a French person with you say an Ojibwe nation um, band going on an attack against the Dakota, then it would seem to the Dakota, well, now the French are against this as well. And so it may be a tactic that individual indigenous leaders used to pull along and to strengthen their own position to say, well, we have these diplomatic ties, or perhaps you don't want to fight us anyway. So short answer, yep. Yep, the, some of the present can certainly be seen as instigating conflict between Dakota and, Chip and Ojibwe peoples, but they don't need to be present. And of course, it's more complex, right? This relationship, it, it, it depends on, on which skirmish that you're talking about. But was it a conflict um, that was covering them and the dead? If, if you killed my brother, I might go to war in order to take a captive or, or replace, or whether, was I fighting over resources themselves? Uh, was the fur trade driving it? The fur trade certainly has an effect in the 17th century about where people are moving to and what they are obtaining. But uh, the short answer, certainly, yes, they would be seen as instigating uh, conflict between Dakota and Ojibwe peoples. That was a great question, thank you. Um, there were a number of questions about the resources pages that you put up in the end, and we'll try to show those again yeah. at the end, and then we'll get that information and put that up um, on our websites. And again, the recording will be up on our YouTube channel, so you can stop and take a photograph or write down the resources. So those are wonderful resources. We appreciate having those very much. Um, the other question was, can you talk a little bit about the role of the doctrine of discovery in relation to genocide? So the, the doctrine of discovery very briefly and, and, and broadly lays a legalistic um, found foundation. Um, it, it essentially, it provides a justification for Europeans to take land from indigenous occupants. So the doctrine of discovery argues that indigenous people cannot own land, that they have right of occupancy. And so that land can just be removed by Europeans. And the first European who comes along, that land has that. So if France comes in, into a space, uh, Spain can't just take that, that French land. They either have to fight the French or they have to enter into some sort of diplomatic procedure. But indigenous peoples don't have the same rights as Europeans. And this is written out um, through church history, Catholic history, providing a, a justification for this. It sees indigenous people as less than human. It sees indigenous people as having less than rights. And so in that way, it opens the door to genocidal actions. Genocides occur when one group of people do not recognize the humanity of another. And that relationship is broken, snapped in half. And so things like the doctrine of discovery, I, I push for revoking um, so, so, such a statement. And, and I would encourage the church and church leaders to revoke the doctrine of discovery, a doctrine that has been cited as recently as the, the early 2000s in Supreme Court um, rulings um, about justifying American occupancy rights 
uh, to indigenous lands. So on that note, we'll come back to a couple of the other questions. Um, there are a couple of questions about giving land back. Um, what is being done to give land back? And let me see if I can find the other question. But if you want to start on that, then I'll look for that other question. What's being done is limited. Um, we see some actions in Western Minnesota with, with Prairie Island and uh, La Caparo of um, an exchange of, um, uh, of overseeing uh, of, of land of state, state uh, historical society land, uh, who is actually running that land. Um, Professor Wazita Ween in her book, and, and I had the resources up um, on, that I'll, I'll, I'll pull up again, does go into a little bit more detail about ideas of how we could expand and, and what does justice look like? She argues, look at all of the state land that we have in the state of Minnesota that is occupied by the DNR or by uh, state parks. We could change the relationship from one of state ownership into a joint tribal partnership or tribal ownership where largely things would remain the same, but um, who is in charge and who has authority of those day passes or camping or harvesting uh, would revert back in, into indigenous hands. It would be a simple step to transfer large, vast numbers of state land and federal land back into indigenous hands. You could do such a thing with uh, national parks. Of course, uh, on, on a more, uh, it, 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 largely the land, back movement is not looking for individual property owners um, to give back land, but there have been individuals who have um, sought out some sort of new ownership, some sort of, of new, new deed. Now, in saying all this, some tribes are eagerly ready and have infrastructure ready to go. Uh, other tribes are still gearing up what that might look like and what sort of structures they would have. Some sort of funding would have to come along uh, with, with this land as well. But some of the most creative solutions I'm seeing are, are these joint partnerships or uh, reverting back to indigenous authority over something like a state park or a federal uh, woods. Okay. Um, there were a number of questions about land acknowledgements, and um, I appreciate everybody's questions. I don't know that we can get to everybody's questions individually, um, but there were some questions about what might be a good process or guiding questions to start with. Um, there was a question about how do you feel if they are the criticisms, that they are empty words, um, rhetoric, etc., and um, Another question about if you've read Anne Hyde's book, Born of Lakes and Plains, Mixed Descent and the Makings of the American West, and about how that might relate with land acknowledgement statements. Um, so there were quite a few questions about land acknowledgements. Um, so I appreciate all of those, um, including how can people go beyond a land acknowledgement? So that's a lot of questions. Yeah, and I, I'm just scanning these as, uh, as well. I'll go back to, to my general thought on, on land acknowledgements that, that I'm, I'm a little bit ambivalent. We, we, we hear them quite often, and we hear them in less than reflective times. So my first question for, that I'd say to an organization is, why, why are you creating a land acknowledgement, and why are you creating it at this time? Is it uh, external pressures? Um, is it because you want to genuinely do something? Um, is it because you want to feel good that you have such a statement? So that, that first question of why are we doing this? Then the next question I'd say is, well, what is the history of this land? You can find the treaties. You have maps. Um, the Royce maps will list out every single treaty um, taken by the United States and who, which tribal nations they are with. Uh, which tribes are there now? What are the contemporary tribes in, in, in that location? Um, what is your relationship to indigenous nations or indigenous community? Don't ask an indigenous organization to write your land acknowledgement. That's an inappropriate way of approaching this. 
indigenous people know what land they have. Um, you can certainly ask, you could certainly seek a, a relationship, but don't ask them to do emotional labor, uh, to do this work, especially without being compensated. So why, why are you doing this? Um, whose land is it? What history do you know? What history do you wish you know? What will be the point of giving this acknowledgement? What will be your action? And what, what I like in the acknowledgements that I think do well is that they list out the action steps. It might not be in your actual statement, it might be on your website, but you have some sort of actionable step. And that actionable step is going to change depending on what organization you are. Are you a school? Are you a place of education? Are you some kind of business? Um, do you have uh, skills to work with indigenous communities and indigenous organizations? Now, the next part is don't assume you know what indigenous organizations or indigenous people want. Um, you'll have to ask. And that's part of that relationship, that reciprocal relationship. So what we are trying to do, at least my, my thought is, we are trying to reform a relationship between all of us. Now, I, I was seeing some questions about, well, how does that, how does that change our, our relationship to the land itself? Well, that, that's going to be a little bit of an individual question. I think for our organizations, we have to stop it extracting freely. Uh, from the land. We have to stop seeing this as raw materials in order to be turned into products in order to be sold at, at profit immediately. I would uh, push for, for a, a stop there uh, to change such a, a relationship. For individuals themselves, I think you need to work for the world that you are, are seeking to, to better. Um, what are the levers of power that you can pull on? I'm not going to tell you just to go out and vote. I, I think while that's an important aspect, I'd like to see action on the ground. And that means that you're going to make mistakes and feel embarrassed and perhaps feel guilt. And that's okay. We all have to get over that. And we have to be willing to uh, get hurt in, in this uh, emotionally um, and realize that this history is, is ongoing and that these walls are difficult to pull down. Um, I'm starting to lose the thread here. I'll come back to some of the questions. I, I see the question about Anne Hyde's book. I've read, um, I've read another work by, by Anne Hyde. I haven't got to both, um, to Born of Lakes and Plains. It's certainly uh, on my list and um, I'll, I'll be pu pushing it up. So thank you for, for the reminder. I have become a little bit lax this summer. Uh, playing with Theo and uh, and being outside myself, but I I, I will certainly uh, consider that in in points with land acknowledgments. Um, let me see other questions I haven't. Yeah, there's some more questions which yeah. I believe were answered in the chat about the discovery doctrine, and. Um, Again, oh, this was the question I was hunting for, um, the role of institutions of higher education in land back movements. And then there's some specific historical questions. If we have time, we'll get to those too. So what is the role that higher institutions can play? That higher um, institutions of higher education can play in land back movements. Higher indigenous faculty um, who, who can present um, these ways of, uh, of understanding don't, don't rely on, on, on me. I, I have a different role to play. And I, I can only be a, a teacher of certain aspects of this history. Um, and that, that's why I'm saying we, we need many different kinds of, of, of educators and ways of knowing. And then respect indigenous methodology. Um, there's been a push for this idea of decolonizing um, the academy. And I'm not certain that we can. Um, un un unfortunately, the, the academy is a colonizing institution. It, it takes knowledge, it repackages it, it often does so at, at a profit. And, and I hate that about it. I hope that there is a way to change that relationship, um, but I'm not certain that, that we're quite there yet. And the more that we have indigenous faculty present in, in, in these rooms, the more we have indigenous students demanding indigenous faculty, um, the more hopeful I am that we can change such practices in the academy. Um, recognizing how much land is held by the academy illegally, projects like, um, uh, like 
uh, that, that, that examine land grant universities and where this land is being granted from in order to build institutions like a Michigan State, like a University of Minnesota, and recognizing how much wealth had been extracted uh, is another avenue for academia to look at. Uh, free scholarships, room, tuition, board, the, these types of, of aspects for indigenous students um, will, will always come um, and, and, and be a popular understanding. But I think uh, the cultural uh, awareness and, and importance uh, of relationships, finding individual support for students. And of course, that's on an institutional level. Each institution will have to look at, at their own history and connection or disconnection with the indigenous communities that they are attempting to serve. So any more um, comments on land map or land acknowledgements before we move to a couple of the uh, more historically based questions? Let's see what else. We okay, there's some wonderful comments in the chat. If you can read those, um, I'm not I'd like to highlight the land grab view. That's precisely it, Laurie. Thank you for, for pulling that up. Yeah, that's a great link. Thank you. Um, and thank everybody else for your comments too. Um, there was a question about, let me see if I can find that. Um, Lieutenant Tell, oh, there it is. Um, was this the same Lieutenant Talaferro, also the owner of Dred Scott, and how did slavery add another dimension to these relationships? Yes, this, this is the, the same um, the, the Lieutenant uh, Talavera. Um, slavery, slavery is a growing field in Indigenous studies generally. Um, Indigenous slavery, enslavement of indigenous peoples by other indigenous peoples, uh, enslavement of, of Africans by indigenous nations. And then also the story of slavery and the use of slavery to extract the wealth out of indigenous lands. So we could go in, in, in three uh, different directions. My guess is with, with the question to, to Dred Scott is that we are looking for a focus on, well, how does, how does slavery relate to indigenous lands? Well, that slavery, that labor is being used to extract these raw materials, these raw resources from indigenous lands themselves. You have the treaties with, with indigenous people and there, there are, are fights within um, the United States where slavery is going to be allowed but also where land is going to be obtained by the Americans because there are different economic systems in place. If you have the fur trade, you don't necessarily want farmers and you don't necessarily want large scale agriculture coming into your space because that's going to displace fur bearing animals and it's going to break apart this fur trade that is extracting the wealth in one way. Once agriculture comes in and once large scale agriculture is coming in, like in the plantations and within the South, um, you have a breakdown in what resources you're looking for. Now in Minnesota, it, it operates a little bit differently. And if folks saw the presentation, the excellent presentation a few weeks ago um, or, or months ago now, I think about Dred Scott, it was a highlighting Harriet Scott as well. And the work of enslaved women and the domestic roles that allowed the expansion of American empire to flourish. So instead of doing their wash and, and cooking, these American soldiers could focus on this attempt to occupy and assert their authority through the work of slavery in places, including Minnesota, through Dred Scott. It's a much broader topic. It's a little bit outside uh, of my expertise, these three uh, fields uh, of slavery with indigenous studies, but there is excellent work being done, particularly within uh, Southern lands on um, the expansion of, of the ability to extract resources through the enslavement of, of other human beings on indigenous lands. They're tied one, one in the same. Uh, now race creation would be maybe a fourth category and the idea of, of, of race is coming during this time as well. So oftentimes people will say, well, aren't indigenous people, aren't, aren't they a, a racial minority in the United States? And that has become the case 
but indigenous peoples are sovereign political entities. That's why they're treaty rights. These, these are not some sort of extra handout or something. And, and, and I even hesitate to, to say it in those, the, that frame. It's an identity that is racialized during this 18th and 19th century. And where on the one hand, enslaved Africans and enslaved black persons are enslaved and black because of one drop of blood, it works differently for an indigenous person. You see, if you enslave someone because they have a single drop of blood, then their descendants will always be enslaved and you have this workforce forever. On the other hand, indigenous people, the limit is set to be federally recognized at 25% of American Indian blood. And it's this weird concept, well, what 25%? There are all sorts of jokes about it. What is that identity? What does that mean? Well, people can marry out and eventually you have this diminishing idea that indigenous people will just blend into American culture. It's something that Thomas Jefferson is talking about. Some of my quotes, I'm talking about a farming institute. It's not only an assimilation through culture, but as assimilation of this racial category. So I suppose we have quite a bit more that we could go into. I will put up the link for the um, discussion about the life of Harriet Scott, which was a great discussion. And uh, while I'm doing that, there was a question about um, the Beaver Wars as a Eurocentric misinterpretation of the Morning Wars that um, the Europeans misinterpreted indigenous warfare and assumed it to resemble their own where victory was decided by killing more people than your enemy killed. Whereas the morning wars was about kinship as a response to death from plagues. Any thoughts on that? I'd agree. I, I think you, you've given a, 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 a far more concise and, and accurate depiction than um, my brief mentioning uh, of the Beaver Wars. Um, uh, through, through your terminology uh, of the morning wars. Um, indigenous warfare is undertaken for a variety of reasons. It, very, very rarely is it ever decided by killing more people than, than the others. And you are completely accurate to point out that Europeans misinterpreted what indigenous warfare was, why indigenous people went to war. Um, it, it's small, far smaller skirmishes. And sometimes it is um, the covering of, uh, of the dead. So as I said, my, my uncle is, is killed and I might go out um, to a bench. I also might go out in order to captive uh, someone because it is a difficult world that we're living in. So if I had a, a young cousin who, who is killed, you might adopt in someone from a enemy tribe um, in order to replace that person. And then you grow with them and foster them as if they were that person who, who had passed away. Um, it might be over resources, limited resources. Um, it might be uh, smaller scale villages or a dispute that two people had. So yes, they might be widespread. They might seem large, but rarely are they going to be about some kind of victory decided by killing more than, than the other. So in this depiction that, that you have in, in the chat, I think it is an accurate one. Um, it certainly speaks to this fictive kinship and it certainly echoes back to what I was speaking on, on relationships and the importance of those relationships and seeing those relationships beyond what Europeans might interpret as, as a family relationship, that they are much broader and that you're using these terms in, in a much more inclusive manner. Any last minute questions from anyone? I wanna thank all of you for your wonderful questions and comments and um, for sharing your insights in the chat. We very much appreciate it. And I also want to thank Professor Jers for this wonderful presentation um, full of insights and things to consider um, and all the great information. And a big thank you to the Eastside Freedom Library and the Roseville Library for their sponsorship. Um, please check out our YouTube channels. Um, we've had Martin Case, who was mentioned in the chat, and some of the other resources. And um, Jacob, if you wouldn't mind putting up your resource slide again, just so that people will have a chance to take a look at that before they go. Sure.
Um, and again, I want to uh, thank everybody for being here and check out um, our other programs. So we'll leave the pro we'll leave the meeting up for a few more minutes. I'll say there was a, a question about uh, murdered and missing in Indigenous women. Oh, I apologize. And I missed that one. I, I, I just wanted to touch on it because I, I, I think it, it, it's an important question. Um, and the person was asking, I'm, I'm just pulling up my resources here and then I'll give my full attention, was asking to include it in, in, in a statement, a land acknowledgement statement. And again, I go back to the, your, the question of why, why are you delivering your statement? And in some cases, I think it would be completely appropriate um, to, to note uh, murdered and missing Indigenous um, women uh, because it relates back to all of this history. Well, why are Indigenous women statistically higher to be murdered or missing? Um, it relates to the judicial systems that have been created by the United States that largely prevent the prosecution of anyone who commits these crimes and that these crimes become forgotten crimes because it's underfunded. It's either covered by the federal government and they do not have enough agents and enough funding and do not make this a high enough priority or it is um, brushed under uh, state law who do not have the resources nor the time to follow up on these cases. Or there are questionable um, accounts of, of where such cases actually occur. So um, I, I placed much of my additional sources, um, historical sources, but of course uh, the Rod Roundhouse by Louise Erdrich is a, a powerful uh, look into this history of um, legal status of indigenous peoples in the United States and particularly related to murdered and, and missing in indigenous um, women. So I, I wanted to highlight that as well. I've only placed uh, historical sources, but um, the world of fiction uh, is an excellent way to dive in, into these subjects. And, and I would encourage um, people to, um, to seek out, uh, particularly at subtext, right? Who has been helping with, with this series, um, some of these authors. I'll also list these local organizations um, and highlight the Minnesota Indigenous Women's Resource Center as another organization to learn more about that subject. Great, thank you everybody. Thank you, Professor. And um, thank you all again for being here tonight. Um, we'll leave it up for a few minutes, but please uh, come back to the presentation soon.